as we deal with art and identity, of course, we need to deal with another group, one that tends to not be thought of. Much like we talked about art and disability, I want to talk about Native American representations in Western art. The issue is the depictions that we see don't tend to be ones created by Native Americans. And in fact, what's happening is usually this is the West sort of playing Indian, for lack of a better term. These images have no relation to reality, and there are some themes that we see with them, but let's get into it. Now, of course, all of the Americas are going to be colonized, and this is going to be an important first point of departure for this material, because it means that all of the indigenous populations, whether it's in Mexico, North America, Canada, South America, etc., are going to be colonized. They're going to be taken over by an outside force coming in typically with some kind of superiority of numbers, guns, or disease, and taking over the territory. And of course, this means that the territorial groups need to control the narrative. And this uh, material can just as easily be transported to any other colonial situation, Kenya or Southeast Asia or Australia or anywhere else. The same principles apply, although the groups and the specifics may change. So of course we see colonization all across the globe. And we see colonization pretty much everywhere at some point. There are very few places that the Europeans do not partially or entirely control at some point. So, this often ignored history of white Americans' need to play Indian and categorize Native Americans into long-lasting stereotypical roles is something that many Native American artists will address directly in contemporary work. However, we need to look at how they were depicted beforehand so that we have a better idea of what they're fighting against when they can create those depictions today. So, the questions I'm looking at are the following. How have Native Americans been depicted in, quote-unquote, Western art? How have these images changed to reflect new realities in the U.S.? And how have images of Native Americans changed as they have taken agency in their own depictions. Now, when I say Western art, in this case, I'm referring to, well, European art or American, United States American art, not Native American art, which isn't typically considered under Western art. Now, the purpose of this material is threefold. A reflective look back into American art history a foundational approach to how Native Americans have been presented by others and how presented and have presented themselves, and a progressive current look at contemporary Native American practices. So let's start with early images. Now, one of the earliest images is going to be this piece by George Caitlin, a well known artist of Native Americans. He does a lot of paintings of Native Americans, which we're going to see. And here we see self-portrait among the Mandan. While a painting like this leads the viewer to believe that nothing but reality is being recorded, it emphasizes what is important to the artist and the Euro-American white culture. In this case, Caitlin's work serves as an introduction as to how white artists perceived nativeness through the lens of their own culture. So in this case, what we see, excuse me, what we see is that the native population appears to be intrigued by the white artist. They are depicted as nude or partially nude, as opposed to him being clothed. When you look at the facial features, they seem scared or in awe when, of course, there is an artistic tradition within Native American culture and it follows different ideas there's different concepts to it, but that makes it neither better nor worse. And so the reaction here, of course, is Caitlin's. He's presenting, and he would do this because it 
well, increases his status. The fact that there are Native Americans gathered around is not an attempt for him to depict what's actually happening. It's an attempt for him to go basically look at how brave I am. I'm out amongst these Native Americans. I'm doing these paintings. is very, very risky, and I'm bringing all of this great information back. So then we have the idea of American progress. Now, the idea of American progress is another place to discuss the incongruity between a native viewpoint and that of the white settler. We see this in relation to a specific print. This piece by Courier and Ives, known as Across the Continent. Western, uh, the course of empire takes its way. Uh, a little bit awkward there. And the idea is Americans, America's growth is expressed in terms of, well, Native American decline. On the left, we have this white community bustling with activity. The major features of the town are the public school, the foundation of enlightened citizenry, the woodsmen who prepare the way for future settlement, and the telegraph and railroad lines, the technological lifelines of civilization. These symbols of growth and expansionism visually separate Native Americans in the painting. And in fact, the train does that because the Native Americans are depicted over there on the right. And it's sort of like, look at them. Look at all these resources they've had for so long. And yet they have done nothing. But us, we've built a public school. We built a town. I mean, this is ignoring a lot of the fact that they're permanent Native American settlements, they have ideas of education, etc. But we're ignoring all of that, separating it by the railroad line so that you have this clear delineation between what is and is not progress, using the Native Americans basically as a scapegoat. Now, we also have John Gass' American Progress, which makes this point even more explicit. Here, we see a white allegory of progress sweeping the West, emphasizing Euro-American settlers' rights to expand across America. Historically, this would lead to Native Americans being driven out and removed onto reservations, an idea that will come up more later. Visually, what we see are Native Americans in Buffalo running as if being chased by progress's movement westward from right to left, from light into darkness. The light is on the city in the background where telegraph wires and various modes of transportation follow the movement of progress through the land. Gold miners, farmers, and even the Pony Express denote figures of progress and civilization who are followed by the light. The allegorical figure carries a school book in her hand representing civilization. The idea is that the native population is running from progress. They don't understand progress. They can't understand progress. We need to create things for them. And once again, let me point out that the figures here, the female figures amongst the Native Americans are, and male figures, are shirtless or partially nude. The idea of depicting native populations as nude or partially nude is actually very, very common it tends to get across a sense of brutality, of barbarism. Here we have a native population and teepees, and they're dancing around. Again, this idea of, look, that's not progress. That's not industrialization. That's not the Protestant work ethic. That's something different. Arguably, that's something wrong. Now, a quote from President Andrew Jackson around 1836 will drive the point home. Indian removal, as he says, will separate the Indians from immediate contact with settlements of whites, free them from the power of the states, enable them to pursue happiness in their own way and under their own rude institutions, will retard the progress of decay, which is lessening their numbers. He's making it sound like it's their job to put, them, to put the native population onto the reservations to save them. And of course, that makes sense. That's how propaganda tends to work. With this sentiment, Jackson shows the racist and patronizing attitude towards Native Americans that existed even at the highest position in America. Now, there are several themes that we see amongst paintings and depictions of Native Americans. 
and we're going to go through a number of those here. The first being the happy savage. This idea of the happy savage, quote, pursuing happiness in their own way and under their own rude institutions, quoting Andrew Jackson, was reinforced by images such as Caitlin's bird eye, bird's eye over Mandan village. Caitlin here described his key figures as stern warriors wooing lovers. Notably, even when the Native Americans are shown at leisure, the implication is one of carelessness and laziness versus the industry of the white man. These paintings portray the native population as separate from white civilization, as if colonization had not yet intro introduced epidemics, alcoholism, and tribal disintegration caused by the removal from traditional lands to distant reservations. So when we look at it, what we see is people out there doing things that we wouldn't expect in an industrialized world, in a Protestant white world. They're playing, they're having fun. These are people who could be working, they could be making things, and yet they're not. This takes on almost an offensive air. The artist, of course, ignores the current realities in favor of earlier literary and artistic traditions, which placed Native Americans in remote and pristine environments. Of course, this isn't the case. They're being moved on to reservations at the time. So there's this idea of there's innocence. There's innocence in the fact that they don't know what's going on. They don't understand the complications of the world. It is up to this colonizers to come in and civilize them. Otherwise, no one will. By the way, exactly the same theme we see in Africa, Asia, etc. Everywhere. If there's colonization, we have this idea of the white man coming in and fixing and civilizing the situation. Of course, we know that isn't the case. We also have this idea of the noble savage, something that uh, Ben Franklin, of course, famously talks about. The category of the noble savage is represented in how Native Americans are depicted in work like Charles Byrd King's piece known as, uh, well, this piece, this uh, portrait. And what we're seeing is a series of men, warriors, chiefs, being depicted. Conceived as Roman nobles, these are men to be admired for physical prowess as well as reason. They represent a race that could perhaps be persuaded by rational argument, as well as the formidable presence of the United States government to abandon tribal, tribal traditions for a more civilized lifestyle. And what we're seeing is the idea of nobility, but is it really nobility? Is having your portrait done nobility, or is it simply remembering a legacy that's soon to disappear? And let me point out, two of these fine gentlemen are wearing these medals that come from presidents of the United States. You can see the red ribbon here and the medal, and he's wearing the same red ribbon, so we can assume the medal is there. This is westernization. This is the idea that, you know, they're noble, there's a sense of nobility to them, but they're still savage, which is problematic. You can't have these two things together. It's romanticized in the West, but in reality, it's very problematic. Then there's the idea of mischaracterization. In other cases, earnest attempts at portraying Native American customs were simply inaccurate or hampered by misunderstanding. John Mick Stanley's Barter for a Bride is based on collected sketches from Stanley's field book, but ultimately draws upon stereotypes. In this case, the prospective bride lies unadorned with a stable pyramid of past generations behind her looking off nobly while the suitor brings gifts to barter. So when we look at this piece there's some issues here they're basically saying look at the native americans they're bartering for people this is a problem let me remind you that at the same time that this piece is created the 1850s and 60s first of all the white man is still participating in the slave trade in the american south and secondly the idea of dowries is still commonly used in Europe. The only difference here is instead of bartering for a bride, you pay for them outright. 
it's a convenient element of history that's being left out of this piece and done intentionally because it's supposed to show the barbarism of these people. Once again, this idea that the West needs to come in and give them civilization. Now, there's a diversity in marriage customs depicted here that Stanley likely didn't understand. For some, a barter might legitimize a marriage. However, the bride's seductive pose or, quote, titillation or availability would not be a part of the transaction, and the actual barter would not be a subject of a painting or element of everyday life. It did, however, intrigue the painter and fulfill a desire on the behalf of white for information, however inaccurate, and articulation of native life. We also see the idea of the savage warrior, and of course there's a, a lot of depictions of this. Images by Thomas Hill and Arthur Tate show a second Native American stereotype, that of barbarian or savage warrior. Here we see Indian camp in Yosemite. This is before Yosemite is a national park, and it's showing the barbarism. Look, they're living out of tents. They've got fires. I mean, this, a hundred years later, you would show this painting and say, oh yeah, these are campers at Yosemite, and we would have no problem with that. But at the time, it would mean barbarism. So, this is uh, going to be a reaction to the oft violent friction caused by Indian removal policies. Now, Indian removal was a singularly brutal and dramatic movement in the history of the United States, yet no hint of it ever appeared on canvas. We're never seeing the Indian removal. Instead, we see the native population as savage warriors, as difficult to contain, or in arguably, in many cases, particularly dangerous. Instead, artists turned to conflict scenes in which Indians were cast as villains who prevented a peaceful appropriation of Western land. Such scenes gradually made obsolete the group of images first discussed in this uh, section which were often pejorative, but not provocative. Conflict iconography in both painting and literature was a manufactured response to a hate of the Native Americans. And here, an analysis of a Stanley painting known as Osage Scalp Dance shows all of these tensions being represented visually. The Native body is portrayed as violent, savage, and uncivilized and it's juxtaposed with a helpless white body, creating conflicts of light and darkness, barbarism, and reason. The would-be killer, in this case, is portrayed in a loincloth, whereas the savior have been touched by civilization and wear a medal around their neck. So here we see the gentleman in the back right here, and he's using his spear to block the sword or axe, which is going to come down and kill this mother and child. And so we see that metal giving the idea of civilization, of westernization, of acceptance of the western world or western life. Images like these serve to justify intervening within Native American affairs and ultimately to ordain violence. We also have this idea of the last Indian, sort of uh, capturing the last of a dying breed. Very interesting idea. Thomas Cole's Indians at Sunset fits into this idea of the doomed or last Indian. Here, resigned to his fate as a remnant of a bygone American era, the Indian in Cole's painting reconciles himself to watching the last of American of America taken over. At this point, the last resort of the native population becomes acculturation. Thomas Jefferson will write in a letter from 1803, in truth, the ultimate point of the rest and happiness for them is to let our settlement and theirs meet and blend together, to intermix and to become one people, assuming that they want that incorporating themselves with us as citizens of the United States. This is what national progress of things will, of course, bring on, and it will be better to promote it than to retard it. 
So the idea at the time is this sort of assimilation or assimilation. We're going to see what happens with that quite shortly. So pieces like this kind of capture what that life would have been like. Again, this sort of purity and innocence, uh, almost a nostalgia for a simpler time. Then we have the idea of the invisible. So sometimes Native Americans are not seen at all. For example, this is Cole's most famous painting, the Oxbow, at least in terms of the cultural organization particular to Indian tribes or in terms of the negative impact, negative impact white contact had on Indian culture. So the Oxbow is traditionally viewed as an allegorical landscape portraying the idea of manifest destiny. And this is a very difficult term that alludes to white settlers' expansion as being ordained by God, but which led to the mass genocide and forced relocation of many Native Americans. This painting depicts a now familiar symbolism, like the dark, stormy sky over the unknown wilderness being set against the light of civilization coming from the east. You'll notice to the east, to the right, we have farm fields, pasture land, everything is well organized. To the left, it's chaotic and difficult. And let me point out, we actually do have a little artist. The only person we see in the image is this artist here. And then there's a couple of boats. There's a sailing boat here, and there's a canoe, likely Native American, there. That's it. So it does get across this idea of the invisible. It's just interesting that the artist is depicted in this piece. And of course, a comparison could easily be made between the oxbow and the earlier Curry and Ives print in many respects. Both of them split the image between that which is uncivilized and that which is civilized, that which is properly used, where the resources are properly used, versus that which is left to decay, because we know that things we don't use in the West just decay. They break down. We would, How can they possibly... Uh, not use these resources. We must come in and use these resources because they're not and reasons. <clears throat> Moving on. Manifest Destiny. Now, of course, Manifest Destiny I already touched on. It's this 19th century doctrine or belief that expansion through the U.S. of the U.S. through the American continent was both justified and inevitable, which is problematic from a bunch of different perspectives, but we're going to leave it at that. More and more, this idea of the doomed native was depicted as retroactive justification for violence associated with westward expansion and the by any means necessary push for manifest destiny. So we see pieces like this. This is by Bierstadt among the Sierra Nevada mountains, or Sierra Nevada in California. And you look at it first and you say, wow, that's just a beautiful landscape. And by the way, it's a massive landscape. It's about six by four or six by ten feet. It's huge to get across the scale of that which is in the West. But here's the thing. Here, what he's doing is arguing that you need to come out West. You need to see what's here. Because look at all these resources. There are those deer. We, we can use those and, and water. We can use that and the, the mountains. Mountains are generally reminiscent or symbolic of mining, mineral goods, etc. We have all that and look at the timber on the right. Look at all of these resources. They have great resources that we can come in and we should use because they're not using it right. And we know how to use it because we're civilized and we know these things. We can shoot the deer and make them into wallets. We can cut down the trees and make them into firewood. We can take down those mountains and find metals. We can take the water and drink it or use it for industry. So even a simple landscape has more of a story to it. Or in this case, by Bromley, this is a Crow Indian burial. And here the painting serves a dual purpose. It laments the past and the demise of the uh, native, but it simultaneously acknowledges that barbaric customs must give way to a more productive use of the land. What you're seeing here is a sky burial. You'll notice the Native Americans have placed the body up here in a tree. The goat down below is tied to the tree and is dying. The goat's role is to bleat to make lots of noise 
and attract vultures that are going to go, hey, there's a dying animal there, I want to eat it. And when they're attracted to the area, they're going to consume the body and then take the body away. It's a form of sky burial. But the thing is, from a Western perspective, this isn't a great use of the land. I mean, we could use that water, we could use that land, we could put a house there or a McMansion or any number of things. But also, to his audience, the idea of a sky burial is going to be very foreign and horrific. Because bodies don't go in trees, they go in the ground. Everyone knows this in 1876. It's really obvious. But it's not. This is an attempt to show the barbarism of the native population when dealing with something as simple as burial. By the 1890s, James Fraser's famous End of Trail effectively trumpeted the end of the native way of life. The profile of the despondent native and his tired horse described a series of downward arcs that eloquently reinforced the mood of the piece. A symbolic wind whips the horse's tail and bends the rider's back. Body drained of energy. The rider slumps lifelessly, his spear once raised in war and the hunt hang downward as if about to slip to the ground. Frazier's sculpture had become an extraordinary, extraordinarily reproduced depiction of the Native American, disseminating this false and imagined stereotype of the defeated native as a continual justification of white expansion and the violence that came with it. Then we have the issues of civilizing native populations, and here things get really, really ugly. Images like uh, this one, Words of the Nation, their first vacation from school, will be quite regularly reproduced. Here, uh, reproduced on Harper's Weekly, a very famous magazine at the time. And this hearkened to the next step, the hope for acculturation or assimilation. The reinforced, the civilizing progress, you can't see my air quotes, set in motion by both governmental and purportedly humanitarian efforts. The truth was, of course, not this positive. So, what's going to happen? First, we have the Dawes Act in 1887, where organizations insisted on overthrow of tribalism and communal organization. What it's going to do is it's going to sell the land. And we're going to see the shrinking of what's known as Indian Territory between 1850 and as late as 1990. And let me point out that no matter what the legislation does, look at where the reservations are. We talk about poor Native Americans. Oh, they don't have money. They just need to work harder. Really? How many factories are there in the Four Corners region in this desert? How many job opportunities are there in the Northern Dakotas or Eastern Washington and Eastern Oregon or far, west, far Northern Wisconsin? These reservations are chosen for a reason. The extra land is sold off to settlers, and then whatever's left, whatever no one's going to use, gets left as reservations. And even that will be cut back and cut back and cut back, because if I over, if I impose, superimposed a map of public land, most of the West is public land, far more of it than what is reservation. This is really problematic. And so we see images like this. And what's happening is the Native American children are being taken from their parents, taken into new schools where they are not permitted to use the language. They are not permitted to dress in their uh, usual customs or usual clothing. They are given very specific ideas, non-Native ideas. Even attempting to speak the language would be disallowed. And by the way, this continues well into the 20th century. We're talking the middle of the 20th century. Your grandparents may be aware of these schools in existence. Canada is going through some issues with this right now because oftentimes the population, the students, are horribly mistreated as they're basically having the nativeness beaten out of them by whoever runs the school. This is assimilation. This is what they see as growth. And by the way, we see it in almost every other colonial society throughout the, or throughout the world. 
Real Native Americans never inhabit the paintings that we see from the early 20th century, created by frequently white artists. Paintings in which Indians were represented uh, were created to embody white attitudes about nature, the right of conquest, and the priorities of civilization. To whites, Indians at odds with Anglo-Saxon culture refuse to abandon tribal customs and become productive, quote-unquote, productive citizens. They were seen as either primitive, savage, or doomed. Over the span of the 19th century, Native Americans were reduced to a few stereotypes or worse, as we see in several other paintings. So, for example, here, The Course of Empire, where it's westernized, but we definitely see the Native American settlement over here on the left under the storm clouds, which we're familiar with that symbolism, under the idea of barbarism, excuse me, under the idea of barbarism. So this is really problematic. And we see pieces all over the place like this, where we get this idea of the Native American as not just not accepting industry, but actively eschewing it, actively pushing away from it and choosing a way of life that somehow we know as problematic, which do we? I mean... Even that's not entirely clear. So when we're dealing with pieces like this, Alexander Pope's Weapons of War, we see an image where Indian culture no longer possesses the myth of corporeal presence, but has been reduced to an aesthetic arrangement of random bric-a-brac, devoid of function, impoverished of meaning, and displayed against yet another grid of Western construction. This could be a piece in a natural history museum, but it definitely doesn't represent the Native American experience. And then we see pieces like this, which we've seen in other uh, lectures. The Hidatsa warrior. And here we see him holding uh, one of these, uh, well, in this case, holding a pipe. And again, it's almost as if he's been posed to look like he's in a museum. If you go to a public museum today and you go up to what's probably the second, third, or fourth floor and you look through the Native American uh, section, this is what you're going to find. The only difference is it'll be three-dimensional. So let's talk about some modern representations. Now, Tom Jones brings in current popular culture, like the Oprah Winfrey Show, in his Choka Watching Oprah. And he does this as if to challenge the notion of the doomed Indian, as if to say, we are still here in the very present watching Oprah. But it's also getting across something else. Think about when Oprah used to run, or Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz or whatever other show. Four o'clock in the afternoon. Who's home at four o'clock in the afternoon? Students or the unemployed. It's getting across an idea of someone who isn't doing well. Look around the background. The old couch, the small TV, is juxtaposed with the wallpaper behind showing what we can assume is a Native American chief and Native American symbolism, the bear on the right wall. All of this juxtaposed with Choka, the man on the couch, and the fact that he's watching the Oprah Winfrey show. Definitely not showing the power that could be there. Now, we also have artists like James Luna, whose now famous artifact piece also directly challenged this assumption that Native Americans are dead and gone, or only in natural history museums, by inserting his living, breathing body into a glass display case at the museum. In his own words, I had long looked at representations of our people in museums, and they all dwelled in the past. We were simply objects among bones, bones among objects, and then signed and sealed with a date. In this framework, you can't really talk about joy, intelligence, humor, or anything that I know makes up our people. In the artifact piece, I became the Indian and lied in state as an exhibit along with my personal objects. That hit a nerve and spoke loud in Indian country, the art world, and the frontier of anthropology. Thus, his reaction to a history of conquest and stereotype takes the form that questions the repatriation of bones and artifacts, museum displays, and constructions 
of stereotypes realized in anthropology. Erica Lord will revisit this piece in Artifact Piece Revisited. And in this case, inserting the, na the female Native American and mixed race body into the picture and discussion. So what we see here is an attempt to uh, bring in more elements into that depiction. So it's not just Native American, but here the female perspective, the mixed race perspective. There's a lot of different intersecting ideas here. She also does the tanning project. And here she takes the sexualization or fetishization of the native and female body a step further in her series of photographs for Tanning Project, in which she tanned phrases onto her skin, creating a push-pull between the availability of her nude body and the confrontational tone of the words. Her pinup poses are haunted by the gesture of her inscription of, quote, nativeness onto her body. This inscription is in fact twofold, both text and tan mark. Lord's latent and otherwise unrecognizable native image. And here, this piece gets at all sorts of sexual violence that we see amongst Native American women. The idea of colonize me. I mean, it's, it's both sexual, but also getting at the dynamics of power, of the colonization of the Americas, of the Native American population, and gets at the fact that this is going to be a violent issue. Here, I tan to look more native, getting at the fetishization of Native Americans. That they're supposed to look a certain way. You're supposed to be darkly tanned, more like Pocahontas than, you know, an actual Native American. So these become rather problematic. But they speak a certain element of truth. And it's a truth that can be very uncomfortable. And that's really common amongst these pieces. It's done intentionally. Because you're supposed to be uncomfortable with what happened. Whether you did or not, whether your ancestors did or not, is completely irrelevant. The fact of the matter is, it happened. And it's up to our generation, or the next generation, or whomever, to try and make things right wherever possible. And what the form that takes, I couldn't say. I teach in the arts, not in law or in policy. But it's something we'll have to deal with. So let's draw this to a conclusion. How have Native Americans been depicted in Western art? Well, we've seen the happy savage, the noble savage. They've been mischaracterized and stereotyped. We've seen the last Indian, this idea of preservation, the invisible Indian. Or the native in the way, in the way of progress. What we haven't seen is an honest depiction of the Native American experience. We are constantly assigning ideas and roles to them without ever getting input from them or creating roles that would be in any way accurate. How have these images changed to reflect new realities, quote unquote, in the US? They change to suit the needs of the day. And when I say they change to reflect new realities, new ideas and propaganda. New ideas that we're trying to get across to the white population, but also to the Native American population. For example, how dare you be so barbaric as to carry a baby in a wrap on your back? That's horrific. Look, this woman's carrying a baby on her back. And yet we pay an enormous sum for wraps today. Or look, they hang babies. Sorry, that went the wrong way. They hang babies from trees. Not exactly. That's purely propaganda. We see Manifest Destiny or other forms. They're always using the native image to get across a specific view. How have images of Native Americans changed as they've taken agency and taken control? They've been able to redefine images, culture, and self. They've gotten their name, well, not their name. They've gotten their images, their ideas, their voice out into the public in the art museums, in the galleries, and elsewhere. And this allows them to be represented in those spaces so that they can see themselves as a participant in society. Remember, to be represented is arguably to be human. It gives them the ability to articulate their own voice, their own ideas, to argue against some of the 
stereotypes that we see. This piece here, what you see is the skeletons with your typical sort of grade school Indian headdress. Uh, the skeletons representing the genocide that happened. And then what we see across the table, all of this junk food, the oatmeal cream pies and artificial cheese and everything else is what's available to the native population at Thanksgiving on the reservation. They aren't exactly given turkeys and everything else. And so it's getting at the poverty. It's getting at the fact that what we see as Thanksgiving is incredibly romanticized. Let me remind you that the first Thanksgiving consisted, or the first winter that the uh, settlers from the Mayflower went through, consisted of them stealing grave goods from graves so that they could consume them and survive. Because they were ill-prepared and they showed up in September or October, about the worst time you can show up. So, native artists take a role. They can make sure that their people are represented, that they are represented in the right way, so that they can feel comfortable coming into the spaces, the art museums, etc., thus encouraging more representation. And you see a theme here. This is the same idea that we've seen from Kehinde Wiley, that we've seen from women in art, that we've seen from uh, disability in art. These are all groups that are horrendously underrepresented and only recently have been able to find any voice of their own because, well, we finally allowed it and that is really problematic. And there are probably many other groups that fall under this category. It's something to consider. Who don't we represent? Who don't we give agency or voice to?